The British government gave the British South Africa Company reign over the territory between the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers in 1889, what was to be Rhodesia. In 1890, a few hundred settlers and armed men under Frederick Silas trekked to Mashonaland in the north of Rhodesia and founded Fort Salisbury, which is now Harar, and later Fort Victoria. King Lobangula, leader of the Matabele people, had signed an agreement with the British that they could mine and loosely administrate Rhodesia, but not settle people, though they just had, and conflict was inevitable. Lobangula thought nothing of it, and the British area of influence began to grow. Many Matabele warriors purchased rifles from local settlers. The South African Company assembled groups of armed men to protect the settlers called the British South African Company Police. Unlike the British Army, the South African Company Police consisted of armed settlers from all over the world. Australia, Canada, America, New Zealand, the Boer States, mainland Europe, Britain, and even India. Three years later, in mid-1893, Lobangula's men were raiding a black village in the British area and some British South African troops entered into a skirmish with the Matabele. Cecil Rhodes, who wanted to annex Matabele land, used this as an excuse for war. The South African Company's police, numbered around 800, spread all around Rhodesia. 700 of them were ordered to meet up at Iron Mine Hill, halfway between Salisbury and the Matabele capital, Bulawayo. They were combined and put under Major Patrick Forbes, and were supplied with five Maxim guns and a few cannons. In mid-October, they began advancing on Bulawayo. 700 British Bechuana troops simultaneously advanced from British Bechuana land, which is now Botswana. Lobangula sent a force of four to 5,000 warriors to stop the column. The warriors ambushed the British camp set up on the Shangani River during the night of the 25th of October. The South African company men were warned of the incoming attack and had time to set up a logger. They then began using the Maxim guns. This was the first battle in history in which a Maxim gun, and therefore a complex machine gun, was used. The Matabele charged over open ground and were obliterated by the Maxim guns. They were terrified by the new weapons and immediately retreated, but not before losing 1,500 of their men. The South African company, on the other hand, only lost four. The column resumed its advance and Lobangula gathered 10,000 more warriors to protect the capital at all costs. They ambushed the British column on the 1st of November, but the Maxim guns again won the day, with at least 2,000 of the Matabele force dying. As soon as he heard news of the defeat, Lobangula fled the city, but not before he and his men burned it down. The following day, the Bechuana force engaged a group of Matabele troops southwest of Bulawayo at the Battle of Mpoings, resulting in a few hundred dead. The scouts from that column, notably Frederick Burnham, arrived at Bulawayo later that day along with the South African column. When the fires reached the Matabele armory, it ignited all the gunpowder and a massive explosion shook the town. By the time fires had stopped on the 4th, Bulawayo was abandoned and in ruins. The South African Company then began rebuilding and bringing in settlers to create a new, colonial Bulawayo. There was still the problem of the Matabele warriors though. Lobangula fled northwest towards what is today Zambia with a force of nearly 10,000 warriors with him. The British sent multiple messages to him asking for a peace treaty but he kept stalling. On the 12th of November, it was decided that for the settlers to be truly safe, Lobangula and his men would need to be dealt with. So another column, under Forbes, 470 strong, marched north to try and find Lobangula. Lobangula kept fleeing north through constant torrential rain and being chased by the British column. Many men fled as force, and it accounted to just over 5,000 by December. At the same time, supply through the muddy terrain was hard, so Forbes kept shortening his own column. By the time he reached Lobangula's camp, he had only 160 men. By December, Lobangula was sick and his men were exhausted, so they stopped and camped on the north bank of the Shangani River. Forbes caught up with them. Apparently, as the column was nearing Lobangula's position, 
Lob Magula sent two messengers with a box of gold coins worth today 130,000 British pounds towards the column's position as a peace offer. According to the Matabele, the messengers approached two company men and handed off the box. The men, though, never told anybody else and kept the gold to themselves. Because of this, the column continued its advance and made it to the south bank of the Shangani on the 3rd of December. Forbes and his 160 men set up a camp on the opposite side of the river from the Matabele one and sent Major Alan Wilson and 20 men to scout the river. Wilson and his men crept through the Matabele camp until they arrived at Lobangula's hut. Wilson then sent word back to Forbes, saying he had found Lobangula and requested more men to be sent over to him. Wilson was literally in the middle of the Matabele camp, and the confused warriors could see him and his men. The warriors tried to surround Wilson's men, but they fell back and hid in some brush. Wilson then sent another letter back to Forbes, asking for the whole column. Instead, Forbes sent about a dozen more men to meet with Wilson's party. By dawn, Wilson had 37 men, including Burnham. Wilson's men were scared, being in the middle of the Matabele camp, but Wilson pushed onwards towards La Magula again. The men marched into La Magula's hut, only to find he had left it in the night and that 3,000 Matabele warriors surrounded them. The Matabele, half of whom had guns, attacked, but they were poor shots and Wilson's men fell back, down to the bank. Forbes and his 120 men heard the firing and tried to cross the river, but as they got down the bank, they were ambushed by 300 Matabele warriors and forced to fall back. Wilson's men made it near the shore, but the Matabele had surrounded them. Wilson sent three men, including Burnham, through the line to get reinforcements leaving Wilson with just 34 men. Wilson and his 33 other men were surrounded by 3,000 Matabele warriors. They stood their ground. Many were shot multiple times and kept fighting, injured so grievously that the Matabele called them witches. Every time the Matabele charged with spears, they were beaten back. Wilson's men, though, were slowly whittled down. Four hours later, there were only seven of them left, including Wilson. Wilson's men had finally run out of ammo, so they stood up, shook hands, and sang God save the Queen. The Batabele charged one final time and killed them all. Wilson and his 33 men were all killed, but during the battle, the men had shot and killed over 500 warriors, which is an insane ratio. The Matabele considered them so brave that they did not dismember their bodies, which was a big deal. After a while, Forbes correctly assumed the patrol was wiped out and fled. The column marched back to Bulawayo, harassed by Matabele warriors at every turn. The Matabele, though, were in terrible shape. They continued fleeing northwest through December and January of 1894, but were ravaged by desertions and diseases like smallpox. Wabangula would eventually die from smallpox sometime at the end of January, and the last few thousand warriors would make peace with the British soon after. From then, the British controlled all of southern Rhodesia, at least until the Second Matabele War, which I have another video on.